I hope you are pretty excited about this video, not only because I'm going to introduce you to Euler's formula, which is also sometimes called Euler's notation, but you are going to learn what is generally considered to be the single most elegant mathematical formula ever discovered in all of human civilization. That sounds really, really important, and I hope you're not going to be disappointed. I don't think you will be. So let's begin. This is all about the number e. This is an irrational number. It starts off as 2.718 and it just keeps going and going and going without any patterns possibly until, you know, the universe ends. So what is this thing? Well, we can generate a function that is e to the x for various values of x. And that function is going to look something like this. This is a pretty famous function, e to the x. It was independently discovered in many different areas of theoretical and applied mathematics. So if you study physics or engineering or population biology or computational biology or finance or navigation, like navigating uh, ships through the ocean, you are going to come across this quantity e to the x. It's basically everywhere. So this is a function that goes up to infinity, it climbs up to infinity really, really fast, and uh, as it goes up to the right, so for positive values of x. For negative values of x, it's pretty interesting. It gets arbitrarily close to zero, but it never actually gets to zero, and it never becomes negative. So e to the x is a strictly positive function. You can see when x gets really large and negative, so when you go off to the left, this function gets really, really tiny. It never actually gets to zero. And here you see it's pretty quickly going up to infinity. Curiously, the derivative of e to the x is also e to the x. It's one of those rare functions that is its own derivative. So the speed with which or the rate at which this function climbs upward is the same thing as the function value itself. Okay, so that is a little bit about e, this uh, exponential e, the natural exponential. And here we have a complex plane. This is a polar plot here where we have a cosine axis and a sine axis. This is really similar to the complex plane that I showed in the previous video where I called this the real axis and the imaginary axis. In fact, real and cosine and imaginary and sine can often be used interchangeably on the complex plane and particularly in the context of Euler's formula. So cosine corresponds to the real axis, sine corresponds to the imaginary axis. So here is Euler's formula, sometimes called Euler's identity. E to the i k equals cosine k plus i sine k. So what does this mean? What does Euler's formula mean? So what this means is that if you pick a point on this unit circle, I'm calling this the unit circle because it is exactly one unit. It's the length of any point on this circle away from the origin is exactly one. So any point on this unit circle, which you can also think about as a vector that goes from the origin to that point on the unit circle, we can characterize this by the formula cosine k plus i sine k. So here we have a line, so this vector has an angle k, and then its coordinate here is uh, k, you know, cosine k and sine k. So that is essentially what Euler's formula is telling us, that we can represent this vector here, or this point here, using the expression e to the i k, where i is the imaginary operator, k is this angle here relative to the the positive real axis or the cosine axis, and e is the natural exponential. Right, so this is called a unit vector, and unit here refers to the length of one. So this is a vector that has a length of one. So how do we know that these two sides of the equation are the same? Well, this comes from a Taylor expansion of cosine and sine and uh, e to the i k. And it turns out if you solve this Taylor expansion, you would find that adding up cosines and sines, or the Taylor expansions for cosines and sines, and attaching the imaginary operator to all the sine terms, that turns out to be exactly the same thing as the Taylor expansion of e to the i k. 
That proof is something you would learn in an advanced calculus course. I'm not going to discuss it here, but if you are curious, if you'd like to see that proof, it's, I'm sure it's on Wikipedia and probably many other places on the internet. But what I want to do now is talk a little bit about going back and forth between these two expressions. So the uh, polar or Euler's formula and this rectangular or complex representation. So here we have the number. So if we look at an angle of zero, then we have e to the i zero. That's this point here or this vector here. And we say that e to the i zero equals one plus zero i. Now that's obvious graphically. We just draw this out. So you see it's length one on the real axis or the cosine axis and it's length zero. So it, you know, it doesn't move up or down at all on the sine axis or the imaginary axis. And we can also intuit this uh, algebraically. We can also think about this algebraically. And that's because any number to the power of zero is going to be equal to one. So yeah, so this is just sort of also obvious from uh, an algebraic perspective. So let's try some other substitutions. What if we look at an angle of pi over two that corresponds to a right angle going up here? So 90 degree angle. So e to the i pi over two equals, and then we can just read this right off of the graph. So we have zero on the cosine axis or the real axis and one on the sine axis or the imaginary axis. All right, let's try another one. Here we have e to the i pi. So this would be the angle pi or 180 degrees relative to the positive real axis equals. And then we just read this number right off the graph. We have minus one and then zero on the imaginary axis. Now, this is a pretty interesting little expression. We can actually rewrite this like this. So I'm just getting rid of this term because it's zero anyway. And then I'm moving the minus one to the left-hand side of the equation. So here we have e to the i pi plus one equals zero. And this equation right here, this is widely considered to be the single most elegant equation ever discovered in all of human civilization. That is a really bold statement. That's a really big thing. So why is this the most elegant equation? Well, essentially this equation contains all of the fundamentals of math. From this equation here, you can pretty much build up all of mathematics. Now, let me explain what I mean by that. In this expression, in this equation, we have the two most important rational numbers, which are one and minus one the two most important irrational numbers, which are pi and e. We have the elementary unit of the real axis, which is one. We have the elementary unit of the imaginary axis, which is i. And we also have all of the fundamental arithmetic operations. We have addition, which is the same thing as uh, subtraction. We have multiplication, which is basically the same thing as division. And we have exponentiation, so powers which is also very similar to the logarithm. And of course we have equality. So essentially in this tiny stupid little equation, well, I shouldn't call it stupid, but you know, in this seemingly innocuous equation, we have all of the fundamental aspects of math and nothing extraneous. We have nothing extra. And that is why this is considered to be the most elegant mathematical equation in human civilization. That has absolutely nothing to do with signal processing or neural time series analysis, but it is interesting to know. If you didn't already know this, you now can participate in human civilization just a tiny bit more. All right, let's get back to the task at hand. So we have uh, discovered that this um, line here can be represented as uh, this expression here. So e to the i k equals cosine k plus i sine k. So the problem with this or the limitation of this formulation here is that we are limited to numbers or points that are on this unit circle. We can never get off the unit circle. So that seems rather limiting. What would we do if we wanted to represent this line, let's say, or this point out here? It's not on the unit circle. It still has a length and it still has an angle k. And now basically it's impossible using this formula exactly how I've written it here. It is impossible to represent exactly this point. However, 
it's not hard to change this formula slightly to get this to work. All we have to do is multiply by some constant, and this would be m for magnitude. I know you're thinking it's m for Mike, because if you just read out all these letters, you end up with Mike. That's just a fortuitous coincidence. So m is the magnitude, it's the distance away from the origin. And you can see here that, you know, we kind of already have the m here, it's just implicit, and it's set to 1. So here we have m e to the i k equals m cosine k plus i sine k. And you just have to be mindful here that this is m multiplying both of these terms. So it's not just m times the cosine term, you also have to multiply m by the sine term. So this is just a small extension of the kind of canonical Euler's formula, and that allows us to represent any point anywhere on this complex plane, not only points that are on the unit circle. Now, why do we care about this? Why is this interesting? Well, again, I'm going to give you a little bit of foreshadowing for a few videos from now where we start really learning about the Fourier transform and the output of the Fourier transform, which is this series of Fourier coefficients. So then it turns out that we can use this notation to represent a Fourier coefficient. This is a really compact and elegant way, informative way, to represent a Fourier coefficient because the amplitude of the Fourier coefficient is the m parameter and the phase is this k parameter. So once you have a bunch of these, a series of these Fourier coefficients for lots of different frequencies, then all we have to do is separate out the m's here and that gives us the amplitude spectrum. And then you can also square this to get the power spectrum. And we can pull out these k's and that gives us the phase spectrum.